All right. Well, shalom, shalom. I am Rebecca Kahabachava from Tushiva Ministries, and welcome to number six in the series Flat Earth uh, Delusion or Deception. Flat Earth Deception, I think, is what I'm going with. So, welcome. And today we are going to talk about history, the power of witnesses, and the power of evidence, namely photographs. Okay, photographs and video. All right, so just so you know, you need to have watched all of one through five in order to watch this one because they kind of build on each other, all the videos in this summer series. Um, and frankly, I just want you to know that this wasn't uh, something that I just wanted to do. To put up. This has found its way to our doorstep. So we are dealing with it in the process of um, putting out these videos so that we can basically close the door on the subject and let everyone know how we feel about it, what we believe about it, so we don't have to have any discussions about it anymore with anyone. <laughs> so this is kind of how we're choosing to do it. All right, so just a few quick things. Um, hoping that you can do this for me if you could like the video uh, when you finish watching it and I hope you do go to, go you know don't just watch a couple minutes of our videos there's so much content here you know put it if you're going for a long drive put it in and just listen Shabbat morning that'd be a great time to watch just curl up on your couch with a cup of joe or cup of tea and watch our videos all the way through because there's a lot here so don't just watch five minutes of it people i can see how long you watch <laughs> okay i can actually see you know uh how long our videos are watched and how much how far people get into our content so watch all of it and then at the end then like it <laughs> okay so subscribe to our channel um like the video click the bell so you get notified when number seven comes out and anything else that we have available for you. Um, let's see, what else was I going to mention? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Make sure that you uh, support us in some manner. That would be fantastic. If you're gleaning from us, if you're eating from our table, then please do give back and support this little family doing this ministry. That would be absolutely wonderful if you like what we're doing and you believe that it is important. All right. Um, let's see. Is there anything else? I think for tonight, I'm, it's kind of late. I got this. It, it's been a long day. And so I got this all set up and I'm decked up, prettied up, <laughs> ready to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and do this and then I'm going to drop in bed. So let's just rock and roll here. So in the last video, uh, number five, we talked about um, 18 flat earth fallacies. We also talked uh, just for a brief moment about conspiracy theory. Cons Conspiracy theories. I don't know how you say that. However you want to say it. But the what constitutes a conspiracy theory. Okay. So today uh, we are going to talk about history and uh, the power of witnesses and the power of evidence, primarily photographs and video. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the history for a minute. So history of flat earth. Um, of course, uh, I'm not Elohim, so I wasn't, I, I don't see all, obviously. And of course, I wasn't there myself. But many historians say that the flat earth theory was not as prevalent in the ancient days as the proverbial they would like you to believe, okay? All ancients, all people in ancient days did not necessarily think that the earth was flat. And even Hebrews, okay, people? So all ancients did not necessarily believe that the earth was flat. So there is quite a bit of conflicting history in regards to the flat earth belief. Uh, just look at it on the internet if you want to, actually don't. I, I went and looked and there are so many people saying different things about where it started and stuff, but, uh, and where it originated. But what I do know is that humanity did not start out in caves dragging their women around by their hair and beating on their chests, okay? So we, that's not how we started, right? As believers, we know we were created uh, fully capable as uh, adult uh, man and woman, right? Adam was an adult male and Hava was an adult woman and they were completely capable. They were, so, they were much more capable than we are. Uh, they were perfect, right? A lot of people want to think, want to Say we started out in caves and whatnot and that just comes from the evolutional uh, evolution crop but so no we didn't start out uh, illiterate with no understanding at all we have known that our planet is spherical and in the history books for almost 2,000 years if not longer and I personally believe that Adam and Noah and Abraham and King Solomon they all knew that the earth was round 
So Melissa Hagenboom from uh, BBC Earth, yes, her name is Hagenboom, <laughs> writes, long before anyone circumnavigated the globe or went into space, the ancient Greeks had figured out that the Earth is ball-shaped rather than flat. The fact that flat Earth is round has been common knowledge, at least among the educated and the powerful, ever since." End quote. So another quote for you, Ashley Evans on March 2, 2021, just a little bit ago, uh, writes in Bible in BibleReasons.com that flat earth theory support has grown rapidly over the years. Uh, websites claim that until 500 years ago, it was largely taught that the earth was flat. However, if you look at many of the ancient scholars, this claim is disproven. Jeffrey Burton Russell, a medieval scholar, taught that the earth was spherical. So did Aristotle, even Eratosthenes, Eratosthenes, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> even even Eratosthenes, and I don't know quite how to say that, obviously, but these early writers held to a geocentric view and it included a spherical Earth. So who is Erathnoses? I think that's more like how you say it. So planetfacts.org says that Erathnoses was a prominent Greek mathematician and astronomer and geographer who lived between 276 BC and 194 BC. Oh my, he was born in what now is called Libya to parents who were probably Chaldean. That's kind of cool, Chaldean, remember the Chaldeans came to see Yeshua and bring Daniel's gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, oh yes. And also the idea that he lived, this guy lived, um, you know, right before Yeshua came. How cool is that? All right, back to the quote. Erathnoses is famous for many things, including a mapping method, method that used latitudes and longitudes, longitudes and his accurate computation of the circumference of the earth. To compute for the circumference of the earth, yes, Erathnoses used the principles of trigonometry and available data on the altitude of the sun in two specific locations at noontime. He worked on the assumption that because the sun is very far from the earth, its rays could be considered parallel. Ooh. He then used the sun's positions from two known different locations to come up with the earth's circumference, which is about 24 thousand eight hundred and eight and fifty four point eight five miles twenty four thousand eight hundred fifty four point two five miles wow <laughs> okay tim chafee says that the only a few historians before 1870 mentioned a flat earth did you know this but nearly all historians after 1900 mentioned the idea of a flat earth in their writings did you catch that? This is interesting. This is a relatively new teaching. So flat earth, according to a lot of people, a lot of historians that say that this is actually relatively a new teaching. So the ancient people didn't believe it as much as we believe what much as we know, we think. So let me explain here because this was new news to me. The reason for this was there were two books published in the late 1800s, one by historian John Draper and the other by historian Andrew Dickinson White, which claimed that the medieval church believed in a flat earth. So both these guys wrote books about the late 1800s and they said that the medieval church believed in a flat earth. This misinformation spread quickly despite that there were historians who taught that the medieval church believed it to be a sphere. Okay, so you have these guys coming forward, these historians coming forward and writing new history, basically rewriting history and saying, no, no, the middle, medieval church actually believed in a flat earth, not a spherical earth, when there actually were historians who had written and were still writing that the medieval church believed in a sphere, okay? So uh, Tim Chafee continues to write and he says, historians now recognize that the church did not teach a flat earth, yet the lie is still propagated in numerous books and schools. According to Stephen J. Gould, a leading evolutionist, which is interesting, who came to the spherical earth, you know, like side and rescue, he says that the flat earth idea was a 19th century invention and it was to support the supposed warfare between science and religion. So he concludes that history reveals that the church did not teach a flat earth. The Bible does not teach a flat earth either. Apparently, John W. Draper invented the flat earth myth in an effort to attack biblical Christianity, 
Once again, it has been shown that the Bible is not at odds with modern science. Rather, modern science confirms biblical, biblical teaching. End quote. That was from Tim Chafee. So I think that is super interesting that, you know, number one, they were trying to rewrite history and they were doing it because they were taking a beef with the Bible. So they decided to you know, create this nonsense of flat earth and primarily because that was going to uh, create warfare between science and the Bible, right? Science and religion, because science says it's a sphere. Science says it's a globe. And religion, they wanted to paint the picture that religion was teaching that it was flat. And there's no good science with flat earth. There's nothing, you, you can't get good science out of that. You, good science will not take you to a flat earth. It'll take you to a sphere. So they were trying to pit the two together, which worked fantastic, actually. It worked absolutely fantastic if you look at what actually happened. So if you care, and if you need to, Perhaps you should go research the origins of um, flat earth and it's it's actually not very pretty. In fact, it's somewhat pagan. So on the website refuted.com, I came across an article written on June 5th, 2016, titled The Flat Earth Cult Takes Another Step Towards Paganism. All right. The writer was saying that there was a flat earth guru who was trying to explain an eclipse. The flat earth guru said that there was an ancient explanation for this. Now check this out. This is really bad. So the flat earth guru was saying that there was an ancient explanation for an eclipse. So he said that there was a second sun called Rahu and that this was known as the black sun and was part of Vedic astronomy. Hello, Rahu is even worshiped as a god in India. I shouldn't even be saying that name. Vedic astronomy is part of the pagan Hindu and Buddhist religions. This is pagan. Yehovah said he only made one sun to rule the day. So the author asks, why are so many believers getting into this flat earth cult? That's what I'd like to know. Okay, so let's just move on. It doesn't really matter how it started or whatnot. It's here and we must not teach this folly to our children. So let's continue on. So we're going to talk about some proof. So in the previous video, I discussed the follies or the flat earth fallacies, right? 18 of them. And coming later in this video series, we will talk about the poetic imagery of the Bible that is used by Hebraic teachers to prove this fallacy. So the flat earth theory and model is really just that, it's theory and some photoshopped artwork and hand drawn, drawn images. There are absolutely no eyewitnesses to their concept at all, not one. They are the ones producing all the CGI and photoshopped images about flat earth. They are the ones pointing fingers at people, people who believe that the earth is round and they're accusing them of the very thing that they are doing. <laughs> They're using Photoshop to create their world, right? They have no witnesses, no eyewitnesses at all. So what do we need to do when we want to prove something? In our society, how do we prove that someone committed a crime? This is, this is really important. Well, we assemble a jury and we call witnesses to the stand, right? And they swear on top of the Bible, which would be swearing in Yah's name. That's the idea, at least, even though they may not know his name. Um, but they're going to swear on the Bible that they're going to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, okay? And then the jury listens to their eyewitness testimonies. And then the jury takes all those eyewitness testimonies into consideration. And then they give their verdict. That's the process. Well, we can't actually take flat earth to the stand because there are no eyewitnesses for it, right? No one has ever witnessed a flat earth. Not one single person has a picture of it. There's not any video of it or there's no eyewitness account of it anywhere. Um, of course, that said, we could take those people to the witness stand and prove that they are lying. Yeah, we could do that. So flat earthers reject all eyewitness accounts for a spherical earth. 
But I want to make it clear here that we actually do have eyewitnesses for a spherical Earth. In fact, as I understand, we have actually 24, at least 24 witnesses from the Apollo missions 8 through 17. These people went beyond where the International Space Station is right now. It wasn't then, but it is right now. But they went beyond that and they went into deep space and they looked back at the Earth with their own eyes and they testified that they witnessed our planet as a spherical globe. Okay, they saw the whole entire thing in one view, right? Not just the curve, which is what they see on the space station right now, um, but the space station's not far enough out to get the full globe in, you know, in one shot. Um, but they saw, these 24 people saw the whole thing and they documented it with photos and film, okay? If we were in a court of law, we would bring these people and their evidence to the stand to give their eyewitness accounts of it. They would bring pictures and video and personal testimony. But there is not one person who has ever witnessed a flat earth that can come to the stand. This is a big deal, right? Since the only evidence that the flat earth side would be able to present is their own drawings of it and some poetry from scripture taken out of context, <sighs> you'd have to dismiss the case. But the flat earthers would have absolutely no eyewitnesses to bring to the seat. They would either be deemed liars by the jury and they would have to pay some price for that or the case would be dismissed and everyone would be sent home to have their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with the crust, cuts off, crust cut off because everyone knows the crusts are good for you, right? Yeah, <laughs> and the rest isn't. So if we have any sense left at all, the verdict of this flat earth fallacy should be the same. It should be concluded to be false, and those who are trying to pass it off as true should be deemed as swindlers and liars. Okay. So now I just want to point out here that Yehovah Elohim um, is big into providing witnesses for things. And he's also pretty you know, strong in his consequences for people not accepting good witnesses. So remember what happened when Caleb and Joshua bought, brought back, you know, eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts of the promised land, right? And Israel rejected their witnesses, their testimonies. And what did that get? That got them 40 more years in the desert and death for everyone over, over 20 years old. So Yahweh has provided two witnesses for different things. He's two witnesses for his head of the year. You have a witness in the ground, the Aviv barley, and a witness in the sky, the sliver moon. You have, two wit you have to have two eyewitnesses witness that new moon. Uh, so it has to be by made by two witnesses. It can't just be one. And remember, there's going to be like two witnesses at the end who are going to be play a very big role in the end of the age and right before Yeshua comes. So witnesses are a very big deal to the Creator. And listen to how Yehovah says we are to prove a matter. All right, so how Yehovah says we must uh, prove a matter. Here in Deuteronomy 17, 6, he says, On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. No, uh, Numbers 35, 30 says, If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death at, at the evidence of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony, testimony of only one witness. That's huge. Deuteronomy 19.15 says, A single witness shall not arise up against a man on account of an iniquity or sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Matthew 18.16 says, But if he does not listen to you, take one or two or more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. You see, Yeshua was repeating his father's words, right? Yeah. 2 Corinthians 13, 1 says, This is the third time I am coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And then one more, Proverbs 14, 5 says, An honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. All right, wouldn't it make sense that Yehovah would ask us in this day to prove conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories with at least two witnesses? Yes, of course it would, right? So uh, I want to mention here that the very first time that human beings ever saw the earth, there was actually three witnesses 
to it. There were three witnesses to a globe-shaped spherical Earth. Um, we will talk about those in a little bit, but in another, in the next video. But we have at least 24 witnesses for the globe-shaped Earth. And there is absolutely none, I repeat again, there is none for Flat Earth. This is a problem for them. So I want to just talk for a minute about the witnesses to uh, the uh, spherical Earth. So up until uh, NASA's lunar mission of Apollo 17, we actually didn't have a full picture of the entire globe. All right, but yes, Bill Anders and uh, took that one shot in 1968 of Earthrise, and those three men in that uh, Apollo 8 were definitely the first eyewitnesses to the Earth. Up until uh, NASA's lunar mission of Apollo 17, we did not actually have a full picture of the entire globe. So yes, Bill Anders uh, from Apollo 8 captured Earthrise over the moon in 1968, and those three men definitely uh, were witnesses to seeing the Earth, but they did not actually capture a color photo of the entire sunlit surface of the globe on that mission. So you have to be pretty far out into space, and you have to be there at just the right time in order to take a picture of that one shot, you know, the picture of the full sunlit side of the globe in one shot, all right? It's not just as easy as pulling out your iPhone and taking 100 pictures of your nephew eating spaghetti, you know? It's very, very tricky. Uh, it's more complicated than that. So four years after Apollo 8 um, took Earth, the Earthrise photo, on December 7, 1972, Apollo 17 took the most famous and most reproduced photograph in history known as the Blue Marble. So behind me, I am hoping that I have here the Blue Marble, that photo that they took. Absolutely crazy, but for 43 years, that was the only full color photo from deep space of our planet for 43 years, and it's a huge story. Um, then finally, in 2015, NASA launched uh, something called Discover Deep Space Climate Observatory. So I'm just going to read a little excerpt from uh, Haley Weiss, uh, who wrote an article in 2018 called We Only Had One Photograph of the Entire Earth Until Three Years Ago. That was the name of the article. Um, so she was saying that this was a satellite and a mission with a contentious history spanning four presidencies and three decades. All right, it's, a, it's actually a huge story, and I read the whole thing, and it's pretty huge uh, as to why it took so long to get another photo. But we now have a satellite that floats nearly one million miles away, balanced between the gravitational poles of the sun and the Earth, shooting back to us full frame, one shot photos of Earth multiple times a day. As of the publishing of her article in May 2018, Haley says that we do have, that we have actually racked up over 13,000 single shot photos of the Earth. And then quote, the satellite uh, utilizes two instruments, the NISTAR, or a, a radiometer, and the Earth polychromatic imaging uh, camera, which is nicknamed the EPIC which has 10 filters to photograph the planet's light at different wavelengths, helping to measure ozone, aerosol, vegetation, and cloud co cover levels. It's the epic that produces the full Earth images that we see online today. So uh, th it was quite an interesting story, uh, a good read as to w why it took so long to go up and what was going on with the satellite and why it actually ended up in storage for a few years. Um, President Bush like didn't want to deal with it and stuff. and so. As far as I know, it is still out there in space, shooting back images to Earth. Uh, it has a dual purpose now, not just to take pictures of the Earth, but also to help to monitor the Earth's health, I guess. So unfortunately, I have to mention that it is the environmentalists who have pushed who pushed really hard to get that satellite to happen. Um, primarily Al Gore in particular, uh, who, as Haley said, he was a tireless advocate for environmental awareness. So, I mean, as a believer who believes that Yehovah Elohim created all things and that uh, we are supposed to worship him and not worship what he made, unfortunately, the environmentalists don't feel the same way. Environmentalists uh, want to worship the created instead of the creator. So they don't even acknowledge Yehovah. What they want is for us to worship Mother Earth. And um, so they're bringing with the satellite, their agenda is really brought to the front because 
uh, believers and creationists aren't really, you know, allowed to speak as much as they are about this. And they're the ones that pushed to have this. So at least that's my take on it. So Haley wrote that the um, Earthrise photo from 1968 uh, from Bill Anders actually spurred the pro-environmental legislation and the inception of Earth Day. So it blows my mind. I mean, when they, when those guys were up, you're going to see me talk about that later. I'm not going to spoil that. But anyway, it, it's crazy that, I mean, the guys were actually um, praising Yah or praising God for what they were seeing. And the uh, environmentalists took the picture that they took and they did what they wanted to with it and did help made it help their agenda. So, of course, it's just an, another way that Hasidon is trying to steal the beauty of Yah's most beautiful creation for his own agenda, right? So we must remember that uh, the pagans and environmentalists and everybody who um, does not believe in Yehovah will not give him credit for anything. Um, that they will, did not, they do not, and they will not be using the technology, this technology wisely as they want to ignore the creator of the earth and focus on worshiping the earth instead of its creator, right? So that said, remember, remember that the rain falls on both the wicked and the righteous, okay? So, so does this truth, okay? So we have the satellite that is raining back photographs of this beautiful earth that Yehovah has made and those photographs are raining down on the wicked and the righteous. All right. We who do know the truth can use this work, the photographs that are coming back from the satellite and all the other things that we're getting back from the satellites that are in space and everything. We can actually use this work and glorify Yehovah Elohim for his most beautiful workmanship, his handiwork, our spherical earth. So it is super hot here and it's super late and I'm going to close shop here, but uh, Yehovah bless you uh, with clarity and may he rescue you from this lie. And may you embrace the beautiful planet that he made for us, the spherical, beautiful ball that is that we call Earth, our home that he made us. Uh, part seven is coming where we're going to talk about the blue marble my reaction to firsthand witness accounts and what's the center of the universe. So stay tuned for part seven. Thanks for watching. Shalom. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, now everyone shoo out. Shoo, 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 go. <laughs> oh no, I think it broke.